Mr. Rosinkowski, are you busy? I'm just looking at some old pictures. Come on in. Family pictures? <laughs> Holy crap, that's a dead person. <laughs> <laughs> Last murder case before I retired. How many bodies do you see there? Careful. It's a trick question. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, you'll never get it. It's a fraction. <laughs> Step into the elegant world where numbers unfold in infinite layers of beauty and complexity. Imagine a sequence that defies traditional arithmetic, where each fraction reveals a deeper connection to the essence of mathematics itself. Welcome to the mesmerizing realm of continued fractions. I just hate the way that one gets so into her work. You boys have been very naughty. I'm gonna have to assign you extra homework. Darn it, fractions are so hard. What'd you get for number four? She said don't share answers! A proper fraction consists of a numerator that is an integer and a denominator which is also an integer but not zero, where the numerator is strictly less than the denominator and the value of the fraction is less than one. In contrast, an improper fraction is where the numerator is larger than the denominator and the value of the fraction is larger than one. And so an improper fraction can be written as a whole number part plus a proper fractional part. For example, seven fifths can be written as one plus two fifths. Now how about 13 over 11, which can be expressed as 1 plus 2 elevenths? A trick we will employ today is the act of taking the reciprocal of a fraction like so. And when we take this improper fraction and express it as a whole number part plus a proper fraction part, we have now expressed this improper fraction with unit fractions, all the numerators are equal to 1. And that makes this a simple continued fraction with the following shorthand notation. Let's do another, 237 over 139. By starting with a little division, we can find the whole number part of this improper fraction to be one, leaving us with a fractional part of 98 over 139. Now, working with the fraction part, we will express it using double reciprocals. And when we take the new improper fraction and split it into its whole number part and its proper fractional part, we can express it like this. And we'll continue to work on the fractional part until we can write it in a way where we have a simple continued fraction where all the numerators are equal to one. So with a few iterations here, this particular improper fraction can be written as one plus one over one plus one over two plus one over two plus one over one plus one over one plus one over three plus one over two. It took us a few iterations to get there. And the shorthand notation for this particular one would be written as follows, 1 colon 1, 2, 2, 1, 1, 3, 2. This is a finite, simple, continued fraction. In fact, every rational number can be written as a finite, simple, continued fraction. What kind of number would an infinite continued fraction represent? If you guessed an irrational number, you're correct. 
An irrational number as a decimal representation is one that does not repeat or have a pattern that is noticeable. Yet we can closely approximate irrational numbers using rational values. Now irrational numbers fall into two camps, algebraic numbers such as the square root of 2 or the cube root of 3 or 1 plus radical 5 over 2 which is the golden ratio. And then you have the irrational numbers called transcendental numbers. And those would be numbers such as pi and e. And these numbers really embody the character behind real numbers. So we'll start with an algebraic irrational number like the square root of 2. One can see its decimal representation does not show an obvious pattern in the digits. They appear randomly placed, so we're wondering if we can approximate this number with a fraction, a rational number. Now, numbers like this can be calculated through successive sums that approximate the value with a ratio that has a certain level of accuracy. And we're going to now use something called a conjugate to help us out here. So notice that we can express radical 2 minus 1 in this way as 1 over radical 2 plus 1. And then we can have the square root of 2 be written as an integer part 1 plus a fractional part here, which we can then rewrite the numerator in an equivalent way to now extract another whole number plus fractional part. Now that fractional part that we have there, 1 over the square root of 2 plus 1, will iterate itself throughout the process, and therefore we will get this pattern of 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2, etc. And therefore the square root of 2 can be written in shorthand notation as 1 colon 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2 repeating, and to indicate the repeating pattern we put a dot over the numbers that repeat. And so what we will see is that square roots can always be written as an infinite, simple, continued fraction. Now radicals are square roots, and they are known as quadratic surds. The thing about continued fractions is that all simple, repeating, infinite, continued fractions are quadratic surds, that are square roots. A few textbook examples would be the square root of 3, which has this nice pattern, the square root of 5, which has this simple pattern, and the square root of 7, which has a little bit longer lengthy repeating pattern, but a pattern nonetheless. Pretty cool, right? Can you predict what a continued fraction would have to look like for a transcendental number, such as pi or e. e is Euler's number, and it can be expressed as an infinite series that converges very slowly. Continued fractions have an excellent convergence property. It makes them really good for an iterative process of successive approximation for a more efficient value. So here is E represented as its non-periodic continued fraction representation. So transcendental numbers are non-periodic infinite continued fractions, and although they are not periodic, that doesn't mean we can't appreciate a few patterns so if we look at the way that this is constructed, 
we can see a glimpse of a particular pattern emerging in the shorthand notation for this. And let's consider something like pi over four, or another way of writing that for pi, in the non-simple continued fraction form where the numerators are no longer one. And you can appreciate some beauty here, but we'll talk more about this later. Next, how to find the value of a periodic continued fraction. We can always find the limit to a periodic continued fraction, provided one thing. Provided that that limit is not equal to zero. We'll see why in a moment. So here's a problem. Can you find the value of this continued fraction? It starts with 4 plus 5 over 4 plus 5 over 4 plus 5 over 4 ad nauseum. Let's call this limit L. Pause the video now to see if you can find the value. For now, let's do a few approximations. So on first approximation, we'll take 4 and add 5 fourths to it, giving us 21 fourths or 5.25 as our initial estimation. For L2, we'll take 4 plus 5 over 4 plus 5 over 4, and that's 104 over 21, which is 4.95238. Third approximation. We'll get 4 plus 5 over 4, plus 5 over 4, plus 5 over 4, giving us 521 over 104, which is approximately equal to 5.009615, and then the fourth approximation, 4.998086. So it appears that if we continue this process, we're approaching a limit of 5. Now, is it exactly 5? Is there a process for finding this limit exactly? The answer to that is yes. Here's the procedure. We begin with taking the reciprocal of both sides of this equation. And for this reason, you can now see why the limit cannot be zero. Next, we'll multiply both sides by five like this. And maybe you can see what we're doing here, but the next thing would be to add four to both sides of the equation. At this point, we see that the right-hand side of this equation is equivalent to the limit value L. And therefore we can write this equation, or multiplying through by L, we get this equation which we can formulate into a quadratic equation, one that is easily factorable. Now the two factors we get, L plus one and L minus five, are set equal to zero to solve for L, and the first solution gives us a negative one. We're gonna take that as an extraneous solution because that infinite continued fraction cannot be negative. So we get the other solution to be five, which is what we anticipated it to be. So five may be written in a fancy way as this continued fraction. A more intriguing example would be the golden ratio phi equal to one plus radical five over two. And that has a decimal value of approximately 1.618033987. It comes from this quadratic equation, which can be formulated like this, and because the golden ratio is not equal to zero, we can divide both sides of this equation by phi and get phi is equal to one plus one over phi. And we're going to exploit a recursive relationship by replacing phi continuously with one plus one over phi. And so we could build this continued fraction for the golden ratio. 
And in this way, it's got a simple shorthand notation. But some have called this the most irrational number due to the fact that it converges very slowly. But one can't help notice the simplicity and the beauty in this representation. Let's now circle back to pi. Here's pi as its continued fraction, its simple continued fraction. And we're going to make a few approximations. The first being 3 plus 1 over 7 or 22 over 7, something you might be very familiar with. So upon our first approximation, we get a decimal 3.142857 repeating. And this decimal is actually correct to two digits. So our first approximation gives us a rational number correct to two digits. So now we'll make a second approximation. And here, we'll use a few more fractions here. 3 plus 1 over 7 plus 1 over 15 plus 1 over 1. That'll give us 355 over 113. As a decimal value, we get this, which is correct to, well, six decimal places. So here, a second approximation gives us six digits, and we can continue this process to get better and better approximations for pi. This truly beautiful but irrational number. Now, an interesting number theory application is something called Pell's equation, but it's mistakenly known for Pell's equation, but it's really Bruckner's equation. It's x squared minus ny squared equals 1, where x and y are integer values and n is a not a perfect square. Right, so this equation is useful in number theory. So let's consider a specific one, x squared minus 5 y squared equals 1, okay, meets the criteria, and let's consider what this equation is really saying. Since the equation is equal to 1, that means it's approximately equal to 0, which gives us a relationship that x over y is approximately the square root of 5. So therefore, we can get a rational approximation to the square root of 5 by finding solutions to this equation. So in order to find a first approximation, we consider the continued fraction representation of the square root of 5. And we'll use successive approximations to help us find some solutions. Upon first approximation, we know that the square root of 5 is going to be 2 plus 1 over 4, or 9 fourths. So that gives us an x of 9 and a y of 4, which we're going to check in the equation. We're going to see if this gives us a value equal to 1. And 81 minus 80 is equal to 1, so 9 over 4, or x equals 9 and y equals 4, are good solutions to Pell's equation. Now the reason that this is useful is because Pell's equation, for our equation, can be written in factored form using the difference of two perfect squares. And when we plug in the x and the y values that we get here, we get 9 plus 4 radical 5 and its conjugate equal to 1. By squaring both sides of this equation, we can actually generate two new solutions. And when we do so, we get 161 plus 72 radical 5 times its conjugate equal to 1. Therefore, x equal to 161 and y equal to 72 is another solution to our equation. And so therefore, it should be another approximation to the square root of 5. Let's compare these approximations. 9 fourths is 2.25, which has one digit of accuracy. The square root of 5 being given by 161 over 72 gives us 2.2361 repeating, and that's three digits of accuracy. So you can see we can continue this process to get better and better approximations for the square root of 5, or any square root for that matter. Deriving a continued fraction for pi. 
transcendental numbers are not algebraic, meaning that they are not the solution to an algebraic equation. And therefore we rely on calculus to help us out. So the first thing we're gonna do here is create a sequence of integrals, i sub n equal to the integral from zero to one of x to the two n power over x squared plus one dx. Now when we generate the zeroth term of this sequence, it may look familiar to you as the integral of one over x squared plus one, which is pi over four. And when we generate the next term in this sequence, i1, we get the integral of x squared over x squared plus one. And we can employ a little trick here to split this integral up. We're gonna add one and subtract one to the numerator, which is essentially like adding zero to it. And then we can split the integral into two, which are easier to evaluate. And here we're going to get the value of one minus pi over four for i1. So now we have two successive values for these sequence of integrals, okay? So from this, we're gonna now develop another relationship. We'll keep these initial values in mind. Call them the roots. Okay, so now create the quantity of the sum of two successive terms, i n plus i n plus one. Could, because surprisingly, when you add these two integrals together, they give us an integral of a much simpler form. We could factor out an x squared plus one in that numerator and do some cancellation, and we get the integral of zero to one for x to the two n power dx, which evaluates to one over two n plus one. So the sum of two successive terms is equivalent to one over two n plus one. So we're going to now use that formula in a creative way. But next, we're going to form a ratio that involves these integrals. Call it r sub n is i sub n plus one over i sub n. And this will represent our rational number approximation to what we're trying to find. So now we're going to create another ratio and it may not seem intuitive here, one plus one over r n over one plus r n plus one. And rewriting this in terms of i n and i n plus one as well as i n plus two, we can do a little algebraic manipulation of these sequences and their terms. And from this, and you'll see why this ratio makes sense in a moment, we can now employ the use of the successive sum term formula we have above and get this to be equal to 2n plus three over 2n plus one. The next strategy we're going to employ here is we're going to multiply both sides by rn. You see, the idea that we're trying to go for here is rewriting Rn in terms of something with Rn plus one. Getting this equation by cross multiplication and rearranging the terms of this through some distribution and simplification, we get Rn is equal to two n plus one over two plus two n plus three times Rn plus one, which may seem like a backwards way to write a recursive formula but in fact, it's going to help us generate the continued fraction form of the ratio we're trying to find. So R sub zero, taking the I one and I sub zero values, we get four over pi minus one. Rearranging this to have pi equal to four over one plus R zero, we can then use the, t the formula above to rewrite R zero as a fraction. And then we can continue this to write R1 as a fraction, and so on, and so on, and so on. And so this backwards recursion gives us an availability to write this as a continued fraction, not a simple one, but one that has a very particular pattern. And so if we continue this process, we get pi, or rather if we divide both sides by four, pi over four to be equal to one, plus one over one plus one squared over two plus three squared over two plus five squared, etc. down the line. A beautiful, non-simple, infinite, continued fraction pattern. Now, one final remarkable note comes from a mathematician named Ramanujan, or M Ramanujan. And 
it's about the, well, we can call it a partial Gaussian integral from zero to A. And he found this beautiful continued fraction expression that calculates this Gaussian integral. And that first term, well, that comes from something called the gamma function. And this is a beautiful formula to really unfold and unpack and check out for yourself to see how it is related to the Gaussian integral. Now, one more thing. If we wanted to find the root of a number, an integer to a power, and we let that integer be equal to some power of x plus some number, and then expand it out, we get this nice formula for writing out a continued fraction for any root. And with that, can you find a continued fraction for the cube root of two? Well, I hope you found this video fractionally interesting. Please hit that like, subscribe, and notification bell for more videos. And stay tuned. Thanks for watching.